um, I'm actually going to start by arguing with the premise of my own talk and ask, do you need assessment? And the reason that I ask this is that um, I'm going to use an example from academia, actually. So when we're assessing research and we're assessing science, one thing that uh, we do is we say, scientists write paper, therefore, if a scientist writes two papers, they must be a better scientist than someone who's written one paper. Um, which ultimately results in people eventually just aiming for the metric and for the assessment rather than actually doing good science. Um, and so I'm not saying that metrics are bad or that um, measuring assessment is a bad thing, just that we need to be really cautious when we use these assessments because ultimately you don't want to end up studying for the test rather than studying for learning. Uh, but with all that, I'm going to say that the answer to this is yes, we do need assessment and then talk about those assessments. Um, so the first question that I'm going to ask is um, what are you, uh, who are you assessing for rather? So there's a lot of different people in your programs who may care about things um, and you want to think about who you're assessing for and why and your measures are likely to be different depending on who you're actually assessing these for. So for example, if you're assessing impact for your participants, um, then probably seeing them learn or seeing them grow or maybe seeing them successful in a year's time is what you want to be seeing. Um, whereas if you're assessing it for your mentors, then you're probably thinking about different things. For example, are they learning mentoring skills? Are they growing uh, colleagues and networking? Um, so that there's lots of different considerations depending on who you're actually assessing for. And I've drawn out that there may be other stakeholders. So it's not just your participants that you may be assessing these things for, but also if you have people who fund you, then they probably want to see different things from what your mentee may wish to see. Often they will match, um, but I think that there will be different angles for each of these. And equally, if you have people who are supporting you, so it might be that you are running your mentorship scheme because you work at a certain company or an institute that's giving up uh, time so that you can run these schemes, then they probably have different reasons that they're letting you do that. And so if speaking with your stakeholders and figuring out why, um, why they care and therefore what's worth measuring is a, an important question. Um, and then also the timescales of your assessment are another important thing to be thinking about. Uh, so it might be that you want to see the impact of a single lesson from your program, or it might be within the program that you can, you can already measure, measure some of what's going on. Um, maybe if you repeat the program, you notice that there's trends, so the type of people who are applying are changing, um, and you probably want to know long term what's going on. So if I run a um, cohort of mentorship, I might want to come back a year later or even five years later and say, can you tell, tangibly tell what differences have been made? Um, and the longer term it goes, the harder it is to sometimes assess them or to follow up because you may not be able to contact them. But if it has been pivotal, then you're also more likely to see big changes, for example. Um, so I'll move on to my next slide. After you've thought about some of those questions, you might want to start thinking about actually designing your processes. So you've asked those questions, um, who am I measuring this for um, and how, what timescales am I measuring it on? And then you want to identify some of the objectives. So why are we doing this? Um, and then define observable aspects. This is a really good one because you might want to know something sometimes that actually you can't easily measure. Like um, if I go back to the example I had about measuring research and measuring science, how good science is, that's kind of what we want to know, but it's not an easy thing. You can't just say, well, they did five sciences and they did 10 sciences. It's not that easy. So you look at the observable aspects, uh, the things that people are outputting, creating, doing in a response to what you're doing. And those are the things that you can then start to measure. Um, it's really important to establish a baseline as well. So what's happening now? Um, and then what do you hope might happen or what do you think might happen? And how, how will this change? And I think it's also important to note that baselines will vary amongst the people that are participating. Uh, so as an example, in open life science, um, we invite people who are interested in any type of open science. Um, and so this may mean that they have, let's say a wet lab or a community background. Um, and so when we teach them GitHub, we're really proud if they continue using GitHub and let's say they set up a blog or they use it for a project management or something like that. 
but sometimes we have people who are open source software engineers um, who are also interested in open science. And if they join um, saying, oh, they're using GitHub is not so much likely to be a useful measure because they probably were using GitHub even before they joined. So it's important to understand your baseline and where appropriate apply it in an individual uh, relevant way. And then you can look at the trends that are going on and actually start to measure and understand what's been happening. And there are also a lot of existing metrics available. So I've mentioned um, at the bottom, we have chaos, we have Mozilla, and there are other um, free and open source software related measurements. I think actually a lot of these are very specific to open source. So they may not apply to all projects, but where there are also landscape and see what metrics exist because reusing these are really helpful. Um, actually, I'll just expand chaos stands for community health analytics, open source software. Um, but they have a bunch of really interesting and useful metrics. Uh, moving on, I, I thought it would be really funny to put this slide in as big a text as I could fit. Bigger isn't always better. <laughs> um, so the reason that I point this out um, is I think very much a learning that we've had just from open life science. So we started um, in 2019. Uh, we've been growing, um, but I think over the three cohorts, we have absolutely been noticing a significant trend upwards. But then at some point around about OLS3, which is our, our third cohort right now, we sort of noted that if we get any bigger, the quality of the training um, and the mentoring that we offer is going to drop. Um, and whilst it is delightful, and it sounds better to say we get bigger and bigger and bigger each time, if that comes at the cost of sacrificing the quality of what we do, then that's not um, good. So, so think about realistic targets. Um, and don't just assume that growing is better. Growth that's too fast um, or that you can't sustain is not actually a metric or an impact that you want to be having. Um, and so some more thoughts about who you're assessing impact for. And when you're assessing it for your mentees, uh, I think I sort of mentioned this briefly earlier, they're starting at different places. So you may want to assess things either individually or group people into different groups in such a way that you can make sure that you're assessing them fairly and that you're not actually comparing things that are that shouldn't be compared. Um, and try to build relatable examples for future mentees. So this is things like uh, case studies so that people can understand why they might join. Um, and looking at the qualitative information, not just the quantitative. So it, it's great that you know you had 10 mentees one time and 20 the next time and 30 the next time, but also have the real, the, the hands-on, the touchable, the tangible benefits as well. Uh, for mentors, they may, may wish to show impact and justify work time spending on their programs. So for them, you want to show impact. Um, it might be uh, something like, I've mentored a lot for a Google Summer of Code, which is a program where you spend three months working with someone who hasn't worked on open source before and they get paid to work on your open source projects. Um, so I could justify this to my boss by the fact that we ended up in a sort of lovely try before you buy situation where we would work with someone for three months. And then if we liked them, we would encourage them to apply for job vacancies. So um, impact can be uh, things like the networking and the learning and the growing new people for mentors. Um, and then if you're a funder or a stakeholder, you probably are looking at things a bit differently yet again. Uh, you have the larger scale goals and it may not be the same, same things at the level of your mentees, but instead you may be, the, the, the funders and stakeholders may want to know that the program that you're running is sustainable. So what sort of things can you do to show that you are sustainable and that your program will continue and that it's worth investing in? Um, it might be good to show that others spread your resources and spread your work without your direct involvement. That is that there's a community, there's people who are invested and who are going to contribute to you. Um, and a funder or a stakeholder might want you to address a specific area. So, it, you know, if, uh, for example, I work at the Wellcome Trust and we fund life science related work. So it might be that I would be more interested in funding people who work on the same strategic priorities as me. But then you also need to actually be showing that there's impact in these areas. And the trade off with working with really specific funders is that you have to sh you, you lose some freedoms, you can't just mentor anyone you want, but you have to be more targeted. But the other side of that does mean that you maybe have more stability because you have support and you have financials and so on. Um, so those are some of the thoughts around that. I'm going to really quickly talk about assessing impact at OLS, but Anelda, you want, I imagine you want some time to wrap up. Please, please do this and then we'll wrap up after. Okay, okay. 
Um, so um, in open life science, we measure things in the middle of the cohort. We ask both of our, both our mentees and our mentors to relate on their experience, talk about what lessons have been useful um, and how they're getting on. Uh, we also ask this of our uh, mentees, sorry, our mentors as well. So we're looking at all of the people who have a major stake in what we're doing actually to assess what's going on. Uh, we also check in asynchronously. So this is more of the qualitative touch rather than the quantitative touch where we just say, hey, we have an, a half hour or an hour's call, drop by, tell us how things are going um, and, and have some time to share concerns as well. Uh, we also note things like when we have group calls, um, who, who's attending and how many people are attending, um, who, who speaks up. Um, Right, brain freeze there for a moment. We also look at trends across cohorts. So I've mentioned, for example, early on, we had about 20 projects that moved up to 30 and then closer to 40 applicants in our third cohort. Um, another thing that we have is people who engage in different ways and new ways. Melvika's touched this a bit that, for example, we have mentees returning as mentors, which you would certainly cons consider a relevant impact as well. Um, and then looking longer term, I think these are largely things that we wish we could do and that we plan to do rather than we, we, things that we have done yet, because our, our, our program, I think we've been existing for nearly two years since we first started thinking seriously about this. Um, and so we are at the point where we need to start seriously thinking about long term assessments. And so this is things like looking at um, case studies that we may already have um, of how people have moved on from our first and second cohorts. Um, but also looking towards the future, towards ways that we can build an evidence base of whether things are successful and contextually, whether or not they're, success they're successful. And some of these give us a chance to then make a case for funding. I think one of the um, WANA data, you had a really nice example where they showed here's people who got awards, like these beautiful case studies. Um, and I, I was reading this and watching this and just thinking, wow, this is what I need to be doing with my program to really show the benefit for other people. Um, and I think just treat them as a role model. So great job on that. I think, yeah, okay, I have two more quick slides. I just wanted to highlight a couple of things. So these are some mentions of a couple of OLS uh, participants. So the HCA BioNet Learning Circle has uh, different projects that are part of it. Uh, I think Bioinformatics Hub of Kenya is strongly related to that. And right now we also have a project I am incredibly, utterly amazed by, like, this is a mentee that I think they're going to be going places because they are just doing so much. It's the Hausa NLP. Uh, and this set of projects, they um, are looking at actually providing NLP for one of the most spoken languages in Africa that is nevertheless sorely neglected but the, the amount that they've been learning and the places they're going to be going is just incredible um, and you can look all these projects up on our website because uh, we have profiles for all of our mentees and mentors um, but some of the resources that we spoke about we have some really good links um, to allow you to look at the different assessment metrics so the community health ones Mozilla has a lot of impact reports information. Um, the Roads and Bridges Unseen Labour, um, that is a long report, but it is worth the read. Like just sit down and dedicate a few hours and read it because there is so much about the, the, the human cost um, and the human things that prop up these systems. Uh, and with that, my, my voice is running dry. So Analda, back to you.